Hi, welcome back to A Slice of Physics. We're now going to look at momentum and energy considerations in collisions. We're going to discuss two kinds of collisions, the perfectly inelastic collisions in which the colliding objects stick together and have a common final velocity, and perfectly elastic collisions where the mechanical energy of the colliding bodies is conserved. To discuss the momentum and energy considerations in collisions, I'm going to take two examples, a perfectly inelastic collision which is defined as one in which the objects that are colliding stick together after the impact. So let's say I have a ball here of mass one kilogram that's rolling to the right with a speed of V1i of 4.0 meters per second. And it strikes another ball, M2, which is also one kilogram and sticks to it as a result of the collision. And this M2 ball is at rest initially, so V2i is zero. The after situation would look like this. The two balls stick together and move as one object with a common final velocity. So I don't need V1f and V2f, I can simply call it Vf, and that's the velocity we want to determine. Let's first work through this and then we'll talk about elastic collisions. Now in momentum and energy considerations, you know that it's important to define the system correctly. So let's see what that looks like in this case. If I define the system as the two balls combined, then I have net external force on my system as zero. And that tells me that momentum is conserved for my system, which means that the initial momentum of the system equals the final momentum of the system. And since my system is made up of the two balls, I can write this as M1V1I plus M2V2I, where I take the velocities as vectors and that sum would equal m1v1f plus m2v2f. So now I can put in my values. m1 is just one kilogram. v1i is 4.0 meters per second. m2 is one kilogram. v2i is zero. And that sum would equal m1, which is one kilogram. The final velocity of this is just vf. m2 is also one, and the final velocity of this is also vf. So I have one equation with just one variable, and when I simplify this, I get Vf equals 4.0 divided by 2.0, which would be 2.0 meters per second. And that makes sense. There's double the mass moving, so it's going to be moving at half the speed at which just one of the mass was moving. So for perfectly inelastic collisions, all I need is momentum conservation to solve for the final velocity. But let's see what happens with energy in this case. So now if I define my system as the two balls plus the earth, then I have a situation where my external work on this is zero. There is no external force if my system includes the two balls and the earth, so the external work has to be zero, which tells me that the total energy is conserved. So the change in total energy is zero, which translates to delta K plus delta U plus delta ETH, the thermal energy, is zero. I'm not concerned here about chemical energy and nuclear energy, so I'm only going to take these three. Let's see what delta K is in this case. So delta K is KF minus KI which is 1 half times 1 times Vf squared, which is 2 squared, minus Ki, which is 1 half times 1 times the initial velocity of 4 squared. And this gives me a value of minus 6 joules. Delta U is simply 0. The final potential energy equals the initial potential energy. There is no change in the height. So going back to this equation, I get delta ETH equals minus delta K plus delta U. And that'll give me minus of minus 6 joules plus 0 joules, which will be 6 joules. So if I look at the energy considerations here, I started with all kinetic energy. The initial energy was all kinetic, and it was equal to 8 joules. And as a result of the collision, it went to final kinetic energy of 2 joules and ETH, thermal energy, of 6 joules. That's what happens in perfectly inelastic collisions. Kinetic energy is never conserved 
the process of sticking involves a little bit of transformation of the objects, which involves creation of heat. So there's always a lot of the energy that's lost to thermal energy, as we see in this case. OK, so let's take that same situation. But now we're going to look at what would happen if these two balls were colliding in a perfectly elastic manner instead of perfectly inelastic manner. The before situation is still the same. I've got a one kilogram mass M1 going at VI1 of four meters per second, hitting a one kilogram mass M2 that's initially stationary, V2I is zero. But now they have a perfectly elastic collision. This is the opposite of the perfectly inelastic collision, where rather than collide and stick, the balls just bounce off of each other. And they do it in such a manner that the kinetic energy before the collision equals the kinetic energy after the collision. Perfectly elastic collisions are defined as one in which mechanical energy is conserved. So all of the kinetic energy is converted to potential energy of the interaction, and all of the potential energy is converted right back to the kinetic energy right after the collisions. This is the kind of interaction that's approximated by billiard balls that bounce off of each other and by atoms and molecules in the air, microscopic particles. For example, the nitrogen and oxygen molecules in the air in this room right now are zipping by at over a thousand miles an hour and they bounce off of each other all the time and there is virtually no energy lost to heat and the kinetic energy before and after the collision is the same. So in a perfectly elastic collision, delta K is zero. So we want to know what happens to the final velocity of V1 and of V2. So for momentum and energy considerations, I'm just going to go ahead and define my system as the two balls plus the Earth. So for this system, there is no external force, which means momentum is conserved. And there is no external work, and so total energy is conserved. Moreover, perfectly elastic collisions are defined as one in which mechanical energy is conserved. Mechanical energy is made up of kinetic and potential energy. Potential energy is not changing before and after the collision. So that translates to a fact that not only is total energy conserved, but total kinetic energy is conserved. So the momentum conservation gives me the same equation as before. M1 V1I plus M2 V2I equals M1 V1F plus M2 V2F. And the kinetic energy conservation gives me a different equation. It tells me that 1 half m1 v1i squared plus 1 half m2 v2i squared equals 1 half m1 v1f squared plus 1 half m2 v2f squared. So I know m1, m2, v1i, v2i. I know all of those things. On the right hand side, I know m1 and m2. So I've got two unknowns here. The unknowns are V1F and V2F. And they appear again in the second equation, even though they are squared. So I have two equations and two unknowns which can be solved. Now, solving this algebraically becomes pretty cumbersome because of the squared term here. So I, for example, I could solve for V1F in the first equation, plug that into the second equation, and then I'll be left with one equation and one variable, which can be solved, but it'll be a pretty messy quadratic equation. But luckily, in our simple example, where the masses were the same and one object was at rest to begin with, these equations simplify quite a bit. So in the momentum conservation equation, I simply had 1 times 4.0 plus 1 times 0 equals 1 times V1F plus 1 times V2F. And this simply gives me an equation that says V1F plus V2F equals 4.0. So I got one equation over here. The energy consideration, because kinetic energy is conserved by definition for perfectly elastic collisions, that equation gives me 1 half 1 for M1. V1 is 4.0. I got to square it. Plus 1 half times 1 times 0 squared equals 1 half times 1 times V1F squared plus 1 half times 1 times V2F squared. I can multiply both sides of this equation by 2. And so all the 1 halves will go away. And this simplifies to 
v1f squared plus v2f squared equals 16. So here's my second equation. So I've got two equations, two unknowns. So plugging in a value for v1f from the first equation over here, v1f from the first equation is 4 minus v2f. And i got to square that whole thing because I have v1f squared plus v2f squared equals 16. And when I square this 4 minus v2f, the whole thing, I would get 16 minus 8v2f plus v2f squared. If you're not sure where that's coming from, you just review your basic algebra squaring of a plus b and a minus b. And I have the second term of plus v2f squared still, and all of that equals 16. And simplifying this, I would get 2 v2f squared minus 8 v2f equals 0. And that gives me v2f equals 4 meters per second. And if I plug that into this first equation, that gives me an answer of v1f equals 0. So what happens in a perfectly elastic collision of two equal masses when one object is at rest to begin with, they just exchange their velocities. The first ball will come to a rest, and the second ball will move forward with the same velocity that the first ball had just before the collision. And you've probably seen this in Newton's cradle if you have ever played with that. So to review, a perfectly inelastic collision is easy to solve using just momentum considerations, and then you can bring in energy considerations to see how much of the energy is lost to thermal. In a perfectly elastic collision, by definition, there is no loss of energy to thermal, so mechanical energy is conserved, and then you can figure out the velocities of the two colliding objects using momentum and energy conservations and solving them simultaneously. So this slice of physics covered momentum and energy considerations in perfectly elastic and perfectly inelastic collisions. We started with perfectly inelastic collisions, which are collisions where the objects stick together and have a common final velocity. The total momentum of the colliding objects is conserved in this situation, but kinetic energy is not conserved. Some of the energy is lost to heat, as we saw. And then perfectly elastic collisions are ones where the colliding objects bounce off of each other with no loss of energy to heat. The total momentum is conserved of the colliding objects and the total kinetic energy is conserved which helps us solve for the final velocities of the objects. Thanks for watching.